So um, I had a really hard time not over asking you questions at the New York Public Library at the Young Lions Awards. <laughs> I, I can sort so, of tell, I can sort of tell. I was like, I can't ask all my questions now. I have to wait till we actually get to talk for the interview. Um, it's um, really nice to talk to you. Thank you so much for, for doing Same. this and taking the time. I really appreciate it. Um, Thank you and uh, your dedication to books and spreading awareness and, and all that. Yeah, I feel like, you know, growing up, books were my friend. That's, mm. I, I felt like I kind of got to know the world through the characters that I was connecting to in novels. And so for me, it feels like I get to share all my friends with the world, you know? Yeah, I like that. For me, reading when I was growing up, it was definitely something of an escape, something to learn more about the world. Um, only later on did I learn some of the things, or did I realize some of the things I was learning, like when I read Frog and Toad, you know, and I see this wonderful friendship between these two allegedly male frogs. It was teaching me more about friendship in life. And, and that's something that I think about a lot these days, what it means to be friends with someone as an adult. Yeah, I think that's such a big subject right now coming out of the pandemic. I mean, not that we're not still dealing with it, but yeah. in terms of the lockdowns and all of that. But it's it's something that I think a lot of people are thinking about right now because we were separated from our friends and certain friendships sort of changed because of people's fear levels and, yeah. um, you know, the different ways we all faced and handled what was going on. And um, I, I personally feel like I'm more aware than ever how how precious all those friendships are and, and how much I've missed everyone. Do you feel like that's kind of impacting your daily life right now? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't just the pandemic though. And I'm, uh, I'm sure that you could relate that when you're pursuing a dream and you're working harder than ever, and you know, there, there'll be people that cheer you on. And then people that say, why are you doing this? You were just doing this and now you're trying to do something new. So as time has gone on and, and as I've taken my craft of writing more and more seriously, it's helped me contextualize the relationships that I'm in. Um, mm -hmm. as well as what matters most to me. Wow. Um, so it's the pandemic, but it's also life in general. And I think that as we get older, we start to realize which relationships are circumstantial <laughs> and, and which are more so built on a foundation of love, trust, openness, acceptance, and change. Yeah. Well, I'm I, trying to preach Saturday no, morning. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. This is, you're speaking my language. Um, I know, but it's, but I also, in hearing you say all that, you feel the heartbeat of that in your novel. I should. Oh it. yeah. I wrote a book. Yeah. You wrote a book <laughs> that encapsulates all of these feelings that you have. Yeah. Um, but it, it, you know, cause I, I, obviously I have lots of questions about the book, but I also really do want to get to know you, but it's, but, um, it is really impressive, I feel like, how within this structure of a novel and sort of the world that you created there, all of what you're saying right now, it oozes out of all of the characters. And it does feel like it's a big part of the arc, uh, Darren or Buck's arc, in terms of yeah. where he starts and what he values and what the world tells him to value. Mm -hmm. All of the things that he goes through to get to a place where he decides what he personally values. Yes. And that is a really tricky thing to articulate on the page. I think it's such a, it's something we feel, but it's not something that's always easy to put into words. Mm -hmm. Are you aware going into this novel that that was something that you were aiming to achieve? Honest answer, no. Um, I wrote this novel in a way where I would only know what was going to happen a couple of days or maybe a week or two in advance. Um, and for me, that kept it spontaneous, fun, and energetic. And it was something that I hoped would be passed on to the reader where they wouldn't really be able to predict mm. everything that was going to happen, all of the twists and turns. Um, so I say no, because while I definitely had many themes in mind and a handful of things that I wanted readers to feel or think about, it was only towards the end of the novel that I asked myself the question that I then present to the reader is, what was all this striving for? Yeah. <laughs> what, what was the point? Yeah. And when I put that question out, I had to lean into the character of Darren and have him tell me. And it was then, and I don't wanna, I don't, I don't know how spoiler free we're being, but um, he comes to the realization of what this was all for in a way that I have 
over and over again in my life because I'm constantly asking myself, like, what's going on? Yeah. How am I being intentional? What's the point of this thing that I'm doing here versus this thing that I'm doing here? Yeah, I think it's amazing. It's it's something that um, just gets skipped, I think, in in most advice that's given. And mm. it gets skipped in the way that we are educated at school. You know, it's like, I think that this really applies across the board. You know, it's like, I have friends who are in all different careers that have reached a point like that. And I also had the that experience in my own life, you know, mm. where you you work so hard and you, like you said earlier, make so many sacrifices of, you know, how many birthdays, weddings, Christmases, whatever that I missed because I was wherever I was working or because the hours yeah. didn't allow me to get on a plane to be there for the thing. And, and, you know, luckily I had people who understood, but at the end of the day, I was missing on those connections. I was missing out on being able to be a part of a community in that way because I was choosing the yes. work, you know? And, and so it's tricky because, I got really wrapped up in, in, in Buck's ambition in mm -hmm. reading the book, you know, like I fell for his ambition with him. And mm -hmm. even though you see some of the things that are red flags in the company and some of the stuff, it's like, oh, but I understand that he just, he wants to make it work, you know? And so when he does take that moment to kind of assess where this is going, I think it really is challenging for the reader in a good way. Like, you know, makes you sort of stop and go, wait a second, what is the point? Why would you go through all this? What have you sacrificed? And one of the things I thought was so beautifully done was that, um, oh gosh, what's Darren's girlfriend's name? I'm the worst with Soraya. Names. Yes, that, that Soraya, she grew because of his journey. And I, I love that. It wasn't like, oh, he missed his moment with her and she, he screwed it up and she was right and he was wrong. It was like, neither one was right. Neither one was wrong. They both hadn't quite found themselves yet. You know, and so in this sort of mess of a journey, this idea that they could reconnect, mm. as they both had sort of grown, you know, like that, yeah, yeah. that was such a, I thought that was just so elegant and rare to see in, in a novel. Jen, you're, you're hitting on so many layers that are making me think of so many things. One of the first is that you mentioned that you had made decisions in the past, right? That would then have consequences of you missing this thing, or maybe that it had wonderful consequences of, sure. you know, I mean, of course, when my brother saw you at the New York Public Library, he said, that's her. And, <laughs> you know, and I'd watched House too, uh, but I was like a kid. Um, so the point being that I love that you said you made those decisions because Darren makes these decisions in the workplace, right? Some things are pushed onto him. In some ways, he's manipulated. In some ways, he wants to acquiesce and then make his mother or his partner proud, yes. But at the end of the day, Darren, I believe, and I say I believe because I try not to imprint too much of my authorial uh, perspective onto the yeah. reader, um, but I believe that Darren really isn't a victim because he is choosing to opt in and participate in these spaces and workplaces like someone, S-U-M-W-N for the viewer or reader who hasn't uh, read the book yet. And yeah. he's making those choices. Um, you also brought up Soraya, right? Like Soraya and him, whether they do end up back together, that's something that readers ask me and I say that it's really up to you. And I yeah. think that that's a reflection of your own perception of the world. Right? Are you an optimist or pessimist? Sure. Um, right. And uh, the thing is, though, is she gives him the opportunity to redeem himself. I feel like because, mm -hmm. and I know I don't want to get too much in the weeds, but when Darren reconnects with her at a later time, she is then making a decision of saying, "Okay." I, I at least want to hear this guy out. I hesitate to go in deeper than that because I don't know if we're giving spoilers or not. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm hoping that by the time people are watching, part of the reason we want to um, wanted to pre-record these is so that we could air them at the very end of the month. So our hope is that by the time we've spent a month putting quotes in front of everyone and giving them yeah, a yeah, yeah. summary and the experience and a chance to buy the book and read the book. Ho hopefully our readers are, that are watching are, are people who've read the book. So shame um, on them if not. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's our goal. We're trying to create yeah. a community that supports them in like the process of reading it. So yeah. um but um but yeah no I think that that's I think it's interesting because we're obviously we're in a really tricky time in the world and 
a lot of um, what seems to be going on is a lot of finger pointing of, well, you did this and you did that and it's because of yeah. this. And, and that doesn't mean that there aren't bad things going on or there aren't bad decisions that were made outside of ourselves. But I do think the conversation that never gets had is what are we responsible for? Like what in our daily life can we say, yeah, well, this was my choice and this is something I participated in or this is something that I chose to align myself with, whether I consciously realized it in the moment or not. Yeah. Um, and then figure out how to make d different decisions or the same decisions based on whatever result we want, you know, and, yes, and that's exactly. something that just doesn't seem to be talked about in sort of the culture right now, you know, and um, yeah, I think that that comes through really strongly in this novel. Did, what was your, so you were saying you sort of, you have a, a, a different journey to writing, right? So like, yeah. what, what was your path toward becoming a novelist? Definitely. And, and, it's tied to what you were just talking about in terms of the times we live in. And I don't throw it out there um, as a cliche. Mm -hmm. And I am a self-described optimist through and through while being very aware of the reality that we live in. Um, but I have found that many of us today and myself at times as well, even though I try to curb it, are reactive. Mm. rather than being proactive in some way. Proactive doesn't mean that you need to be in the streets. Proactive doesn't mean that you need to be posting things nonstop about issues that you might not even be fully well-versed in this, that, and the other, right? Yep. Uh, proactive yep. is whatever it means to you. Yep. And you are the only person that can, that can define that. So when it came to writing this book, I bring all of this up because I was extremely proactive. Mm. I was working in a startup myself, where I had cut my teeth, where I had rose up from being an intern to within a handful of years, a 24 year old director managing 30 people. Um, yeah, like making six figures, more money than I ever had before in the same building that the book is set in. Okay. <laughs> it's in the same, different floor. I had to talk to lawyers. I had to talk to lawyers. Yeah, there's, really a, there's really a Starbucks on that floor too. Um, but as you take a sip of whatever you have in that oversized yeah, it was mug. Like, it was like you cued my coffee sipping. <laughs> That's huge. That mug is as big as your head. Oh yeah, no, I'm, I'm all about the big mug. It's uh, with the, listen, the lens is making it look bigger than it is. Mine's but... sizable too. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but I was working in this space and after a few years, I began to wake up due to a variety of different things. It wasn't one thing, but many things I started to wake up at the beginning of 2016 and I was looking around and I said, wow, um, I don't like where I am. My life is no longer aligned with the mission of this organization. Um, I've been preaching to people, especially these younger people that I was hiring in very aggressive ways, that we are changing the world, that we are curing cancer when we really weren't by any means or anything close to it. Um, so it was that year that I said, I need to get back to the better parts of myself. And one thing that I always liked to do was writing. So let me just start to write. And I began writing articles and essays um, related to the world of startups and sales. And then May 21st, 2016 is when I said, let me start writing a novel because I've always liked fiction. And Jen, to be completely honest, it was a mix of me wanting to escape the place that I was working in, even though on the face of things, I was thriving. Sure. But in my heart, I was dying, you know? Understand um, <laughs> you know, You know what it is, right? And yeah. it was also a mix of male bravado and just like typical like sales guy, like New York City tech startup arrogance where I said, I could write a book. So I started <laughs> writing a book, but I was playing playing author. You know, you as, as an artist and, and as someone that works in, in the arts can understand that there are all of these different tropes that we have of whether you're a publicist, a writer, a basketball player, what have you, right? So I said, okay, the media has fed me that a writer wakes up early before work and starts to write. Let me do that. Well, I tried it and that wouldn't make sense because I was about to go work a 12 to 14 hour day at the startup, you know? Sure. And it says, writers work in quiet places. And I was hesitant <laughs> to mention this when we were at the library, but I went to the library once and I tried to write and I couldn't. And yeah. the best thing that came out of that day was looking at the Gutenberg Bible and being like, that is wild. Yeah. Um, and then there's all these other things, go to coffee shops, go to this, that, and none of it was working. So what I realized worked for me was not going out on Friday nights with these people, these wild people, one of which I was, and 
staying in, waking up on Saturday, and then writing. And I didn't exactly know what I was doing, but I knew that I was putting words out. So I would write thousands of words at a time. Eventually, I left this startup, and I got a one-way ticket to Costa Rica, and I finished this manuscript, and I started querying agents. I didn't know what I was doing. The manuscript wasn't even edited, but I typed in top literary agencies in America. And then I started to email their presidents. I started to call them. I read an article saying, don't call these agents. Don't call them. They don't want that. And I said, well, you've never seen me on the phone before. So I'd pick up, ring, ring, ring. Hi, this is Mateo, blah, blah, blah. They'd be like, click, why are you calling? What's funny is that had happened to me at the beginning of my sales career too, before I learned what was what. So long story short, first manuscript didn't go anywhere. I had eventually, I had nine agents who wanted to read it and look at the partial or full version because a friend of a friend had given me some advice about my pitch and nothing came out of that because the writing wasn't good. But one agent said, Mateo, you have a voice. You need to learn how to hone it and work on plot and structure. So at this point, it's 2017. I uh, am consulting with tech startups so that I still have my hand in the world and I'm not living into the starving artist trope back at my parents' house. And I say, I don't want to be here anymore. My parents' house is fine. It's wonderful. I have a a great family. Um, But I felt stuck and I was making this money through consulting. So I said, I'm going to go to Bali. I got a one-way ticket. But before I left, I remembered what that agent said to me. And I did this really scientific, thorough way of learning plot and structure. And I Googled plot and structure. (laughs) And then- (laughs) Wow, I I want to know. I want to know. I saw you like this. I saw you like this and I was like, oh, we're about to drop the hammer on it. Um, so plot and structure. And then uh, a book came up on Amazon uh, by a man named James Scott Bell. And I bought it and I took it with me. And I was teaching myself how to write with this book. 10 out of 10. It helped me. Wow. Learn James Scott who? James? James Scott Bell. Yeah. It helped me how learn how to craft a story in a compelling way. It taught me the mechanics. There's also a lot of inspirational, motivational aspects to it that aren't BS in any way that help me to this day. They're so internalized in me that sometimes I'm not aware that they're still taking place. But now really cutting it down, right? Because I know we have other things to discuss. Um, I read that book, did some exercises, um, went to Thailand because my oldest brother lives there. And I was in Southeast Asia, right? I was in Indonesia, so I went there pulled myself up in his uh, apartment and I rewrote that first manuscript. This, this book has nothing to do with black buck. It was completely different. Oh, wow. about a young man. Yeah. A young man from the States, from New York specifically, who goes to Africa, Kenya specifically, all of these different things loosely based off an experience that I had when I was 17. Um, I had this book and I outlined it from beginning to end. I said, this is going to get me an agent. I know what I'm doing. That didn't, work. I had six people who wanted to look at it, but I had taken all the vigor that the first manuscript had and just outlined it to death and it didn't work out. So now I'm back in my parents' house, 2017. I'm like, what am I doing? All these people who doubted me were perhaps right. Who did I think I was? All that sales bravado bluster was gone in a way that was good. It was necessarily humbling. And I said, it doesn't matter whether it's going to take five months or five years, I'm doing this, but now I'm going to do it on my terms. I'm going to write it for the people I wanted to resonate with in the way I want about what I want. And the idea for Black Buck was born um, partially because I had read Stephen King's on writing. And he had said a few things in that book that opened up my mind to the possibilities that were around me that I wasn't even aware of. So the idea for Black Buck was born. I began writing it January 8th, 2018 at night. And now I'm talking to Jennifer Morrison. Come on. Come on. <laughs> that is, I mean, that is such a, I, I, I just love how vulnerable that story is. You know, it's like yeah. so often we kind of get these clip notes versions of how someone got somewhere or where, how an idea started, but there's just, there's so, so much nuance to everything mm-hmm. that you just explained. And I feel like that's, it's so important for people to hear that stuff, yeah. you know, because Otherwise, all of these things feel so unattainable. It all feels a little bit out of reach, right? You know, or really out of reach. Yeah. yeah. And it's, and, and again, it goes back to choice, right? You chose to be proactive. You chose to believe in yourself. Who, who along the way, like, did you feel like there was, it's a sort of a two-part question. Sure. Who in that journey 
was the person who was like, I believe in you no matter what, alongside your your faith in yourself. And then who in that journey, and you don't have to name names, but sure. like were sort of the the obstacles of like concern of wanting to make sure that you were being safe or thoughtful or how are you going to make money or are you ruining your life? And you know, you smile because I'm sure you heard that <laughs> many times. Oh, yeah, literally, that's why I'm laughing because you're you, you we we know we know the things that people say. Um if they care about you or also if they don't. So um, when I was writing Black Buck, I was back at my parents' house. I was in my childhood bedroom, but it was completely different. Long mm -hmm. gone was my bed, my posters, a desk, all of these things. It was replaced with a futon and about, I don't know, a couple hundred cookbooks that my mom had put in there. She had turned it into a library of sorts. And it's not this grand, large room, yeah. uh, but she had shelves put in because she removed all of my things and there was a futon. Um, th they did that because they thought I was never going to go back home. Back. They said, yeah, oh, right. he made it. He's Mr. Six Figures, Mr. Managing 30 People on the 30-something floor. You know, again, yep. it's not the same floor in Black Buck, but I try not to connect uh, yeah. the real place I worked at too much to the story. But anyway, um, so I'm there. I take a desk from an apartment that I used to be in. I have the desk with me still to this day. It's a very small, cheap thing, um, but it's still together. And I bring all of this up because I would lock the door and oh, wow. I would get to work. And I was working during the times when I wasn't consulting. And consulting was a godsend because I could make my schedule. And I also didn't have all of the anxiety that I had when working full time at that startup because I was more so out of remove, this, that, and the other. Um, my younger brother, I have four brothers. All mm -hmm. of my brothers were mostly supportful to varying degrees, of course. My younger brother helped me tremendously because when I left that startup and I left, that status of all the things that I listed, six figures, managing 30 people, 24 years old. Um, a lot of people in the city respect me for what I did. I was an expert in my field. Um, I was a director, da, 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 da. When I was divorced from all of those things, I didn't know who I was anymore yeah. because I was so wrapped up yeah. in all of those things. My younger brother was the one who said, we need to get you in nature ASAP. So we would go out into nature. We would go on these long nature walks on Long Island. We would go kayaking. Oh. Um, he would bring me to all of these places that um, I had never known about, even though they're wow. not too far from my, my parents' house. Um, and that helped me reconnect with the world beyond me and myself. And it spurred me to ask those questions is how we started off. Like, what mm. am I doing? What do I want? And how can I get there? And how can I get out of my own way and just go for it in some way? Um, my mother definitely was someone who uh, supported me, but she was also someone who was like, okay, is this actually gonna work? You know? Yeah. Um, and to this day, she, she is my number one fan. Uh, she's my number one confidant. Um, I wouldn't be here without her for sure. My father is a more practical man who was asking the question that you stated, how are you gonna make money? What yeah. are you doing? You just worked at this company. Now you left and then you traveled and now you're trying to be a writer. What are you doing? Um, but the, the good thing is, is that I had so much confidence in myself and confidence in my ability to learn and grow. But it was a different type of confidence than I had when I was at that tech startup. Right. That was a little bit more toxic and tied up in the external and the ego and yeah, this was more it's so, more ego driven right exactly but this was more so tied to service mm. and living into my purpose of turning my ideas into reality to positively impact others so as i was writing this book and if i were to ever get into a rut i would say who do i want to read this what do I want the effect to be? Who am I helping by actually writing this? Make no mistake, I wanted to impress myself first and foremost and write something that I would be proud of. But at the sure. same time, I was also holding in my mind the people who I hope that this would help in some way. Um, there were also a couple people in my life who were definitely confused and saying, "What, bro, what are you doing? Like trying to be mm -hmm. a writer? Who do you think you are? There were people that had a strong hold on my mind that were saying, I don't think you're a good writer from the things that I've seen in the past based on their limited experience with whatever the, a Facebook post that they might've read that I've written or something. Um, so That's I had- a great to, way to judge someone's writing. <laughs> but, but the thing is, is 
Anyone can do that. Billions of people in this world can do that, but it's about what you allow to enter into your sphere. So what did I do? How did I remedy those situations as I cut those people off? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't on some, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm going to be a star. It was, you can think that that's fine. And that's okay. I'm not even going to let it hurt me, but I'm actually going to cut off communication now because it's a distraction. Yeah. So that, that's a little bit about the, the people it's, that were in my sphere. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting too, because it's like, when you're, when you're pursuing an artistic endeavor that feels scary to the people mm. around you, not well, also to you, but yeah, you know, yeah. around you, um, you can sort of feel when that fear, like when you're talking about your dad, like he's practical, but he loves you. Like that practicality yes. is coming from a place of wanting to support you and you can feel the intention behind yes. the concern. Whereas there's other people where you feel their, the intention behind the concern is well, whether it's their own insecurity or their own jealousy or whatever, where it's mm -hmm. kind of like, well, I'm going to cut him off at the yeah. knees because or try. I'm not going to make a choice to do this. You know what I mean? Like they may not be aware they're doing that, but it's, it's interesting how you really can, if you, if you give yourself the space to, you really can feel the difference of those intentions when they come at you of like, okay, I can accept this practicality because I know it's coming at me in love and I mm -hmm. have to just push this away because it is not it's not healthy, you know? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's nuance. Yeah. It's new, all of these things are nuanced going back to, again, what we were talking about, about the times that we live in, there's nuance in so many things, but it's up to us to be proactive and make the decision about what we will engage with and what we won't and yeah. make the mistake. Right. And I'm just talking to I'm not talking to you in this moment because I can imagine, I, I know that you've experienced all of these things, but I have a lot of people who say, you know, Mateo, oh man, I saw you on the Today Show. I saw you in the newspaper. I saw you on it. I heard you on NPR or this, that, and the other. Or you were just at this thing, you know, or you were with Jennifer Morrison at the New York Public Library. <laughs> and um, all of these de decisions have consequences. Yeah. So when I was writing Black Buck and I cut myself off from 90% of people that I knew and 90% mm. of people that I'd spent time with, mm. it helped me do what I need to do. It helped me focus on the handful of people who loved me unconditionally and who were there for me, regardless of if I was writing or not. But then it also set me on this path where it's like, I wrote this book and I'm being perceived of uh, being at this place early on in my career from one book. And there's only so many people that I can speak with about it. Yeah, that's right? interesting. Yeah, then there's there, there's an interesting isolation in that as well. Yeah, I'm not complaining because it's like, wow, oh, like you're no, no. a seller. But I you know what I'm it. saying? No, there's a complexity to success. And, um, you know, I was talking to Kalani yesterday who wrote um, I Will Die in a Foreign Land. And, and yeah. interestingly, um, similar stuff came up about how no one really uh, talks about the other side of success and and how complicated that is because mm -hmm. you're you're grateful you're excited there's no better feeling than being like not only am i proud of this but other people like it too and you know all of those things are great but there's also so much pressure that floods in on the other yeah. side and you have you're suddenly expected to be an expert on all sorts of things that maybe you're yeah. not an expert on. You may or may yes. not be an expert on and people yeah. address you as if you're an expert and you're like, hang on, especially when, especially as an actor, which I think is very similar to being an author in a certain way. Cause you sort of have to bring life to all these people. You know, it's yeah. like, I, I, I just played a, a, a veteran, you know, a war veteran. It's like, I've never been to war. I can do all the research in the world and I can, donate to charities, I can support causes, I can read memoirs, I can do all the research to, to make my body move the way it's supposed to move and, and try to understand all those emotions, but I will never actually be- When, a when they hand you the AK-47, you don't know what to do. <laughs> right, well, I mean, you know, it's just, and then you get asked questions sometimes, like you're supposed to be an expert, you know, oh, and you're like, yeah. oh, hang on, I'm just, I'm just someone pretending to be someone. Um, mm. So anyway, there's, there's all that complexity. And then, and then there's the pressure that you never had for the first thing, right? So with the first thing, no one believes in you. So there's nothing to lose, right? Or no one knows who you are. Right. And then the yeah. second thing, it's like, what's next? And you're like, I don't know. <laughs> you know? And like, and like me, I, um, I strive to be as honest as possible, almost to a fault, right? Because it's like, if I am chatting 
with someone I don't even really know, but maybe someone that messages me on Instagram, they had read Black Buck and they're asking how the second book is going or something like that. Um, I'm a very open individual where I'll say, you know, I'm getting to it. I'm working on it or, you know, ups and downs. And then after I say that, I'm like, damn, like I just articulated this vulnerability or the fact that there's ups and downs with the second thing that I'm working on. Is this going to color their perspective when they read it and say he wasn't as confident in it as he was in Black Buck? So it might not be as all of these different things that you have to contend with, right? Yeah. Um, where it's like, as you said, when I was at my parents' house writing in my childhood bedroom, there weren't people saying, you know, what's going on with your book as much or anything like that. And, and there, there wasn't the expectation that I was also going to know exactly every single thing that happened during the process of right. even writing that book. There's right. sometimes people ask me questions of what were you thinking of at this point when writing Black Buck or what was happening at this point in your life? And I'll just say, I don't know, or I don't remember <laughs> Yeah, because that was 2018 and yeah. a lot has happened since then. Yeah. Um, when you were in that process of putting it together, I know you were saying earlier that you kind of, you had a sense of the idea and the themes and yeah. what you wanted to do, but you were kind of keeping yourself, surprising yourself about two weeks out from each stretch. Mm. Um, was there a point in that process where you were involved with an editor or you just wrote the whole thing and then you sent it off to see if people were interested? Me, myself and I, <laughs> it was just me. So, yeah. so uh, no one's ever asked me that question. Wow. I of like, I don't know, hundred interviews or something. No one's ever asked me that. Uh, it was just me. The way that I write is in a vacuum and that has pros and cons. A pro, let's talk about Black Buck. Yeah. And I was going to go into the second novel, but you see now I'm he and now hesitating. So a pro with Black Buck is that I wrote it. I worked on a handful of drafts. I kicked it over to like two friends who mm -hmm. I thought like could relate to the book. And they gave me different types of feedback, this, that, and the other. And it was, I'm not shrugging it off, right? Like I, I, I read it and I ingested it, of course. Yeah. Um, but it was all on me for at least four drafts. Wow. And what that did, and the first draft, Jen, was 168,000 words. Like, that was like 500 and something pages. What you have right on your desk is like 110,000 words. I had to cut so much on my own before I got an agent. I cut about like 40,000 words on my own. All these subplots. There were other people on the Happy Campers. There was a romantic oh. subplot between two characters that whatever. There was more about Barry D and, and Darren or at that point Buck's work with him. There was so much in there. A lot more about sales and uh, the world of startups in there that I all had to take out. Point being is that doing all of that myself helped me hone my vision to the point where when I got an agent, I had way more control than someone else would have been mm -hmm. if they had been working along with someone or whatever, right? Yeah. So then when I got my agent and then a handful of months later, I got my editor, I was the expert of this book. And it wasn't me being an expert in my way or the highway, but if someone had a piece of feedback or something for me to consider, if I didn't have a reasonable, not reasonable, but a quality response for why something the way that it was, was the way that it was, then I would change it. I say, okay, we need to change that because I want to be as intentional as possible. Yeah. Um, the con with writing in a vacuum is that you could be, you could spend months or years doing something that isn't doing what you wanted to do, but you didn't know or you weren't aware of it because you were writing in a vacuum. I'm yeah, okay yeah. with risks, so yeah, yeah. I'll do that. Yeah. Um, that's, yeah, so that's that's what I was doing in terms of Black so it's, it's interesting to hear that though, because I think I said this to you when I saw you at the library, um, it reads almost like a memoir. It's, mm. I kept having to remind myself that yeah. this didn't all actually happen, that this was fiction because there was so much texture to the whole world that you establish that you just keep feeling like, oh, this, is, this must be someone recounting something that actually happened. It feels too real. It feels too alive to not be that. Yeah. And I, I think that that must be the voice that that, that 
early editor or publisher noticed that you're you're bringing to life in your work but I also feel like that may be partially to the fact that you had another 400,000 words there at some point you know like where if you've fleshed out the world so extensively that it could have been a 500 page book Mm -hmm. and and you had all these subplots and all these extra things even though those things were lifted out I think you still feel their presence in what's still there you know it's like mm. it's like what i i mean i i can only relate it to what i know in terms of being a filmmaker and an actor but it's like when you when you give rehearsal scenes to actors that aren't in the play or aren't in the film you know mm. and then they fill out this history that yeah. they wouldn't have had with each other that never ends up getting filmed and doesn't go into the movie and you know all this stuff but there's something that the audience will feel and the texture yes. and the nuance that they kind of have that shared experience together, yes. you know? Yes. And I feel like that, that feels present, you know, hearing you say that, I'm like, that makes so much sense to me because it really did take my breath away. Like I, I just was like, how did this guy do this? Like, <laughs> I really, well, I'll, like, tell, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about how, um, above my, my writing desk, I have a, a photo of Muhammad Ali and he's jump roping. And that's to help me remember that most of the work is done behind the scenes as you're talking mm-hmm. about, right? The backstory, filling these things out, cutting things that never will be seen by the reader. But if you've done your job, they will feel it. And yeah. they will feel as you're saying the texture, knowing that this world at least feels real. Um, but also what helped me was when I was crafting this novel, there was so much in there, so much that I was trying to do that in the beginning, Mm -hmm. I I had to say, how am I going to make this easy on myself? So there were a few things that I did know. I knew about the big twist at the end. And then it was more so a matter of how am I going to get there and ratchet things up from chapter to chapter. Uh, I knew that he was going to be um, a young black man from Brooklyn. I knew that he was going to work in a startup in sales. And I knew that I knew the general vibe of, of the types of people that were going to be there. The reason why some of this can feel so real is that I didn't have to do any research for what it meant to work in sales. I didn't have to do any research for what it meant to be a young black man in America. I didn't have to do any research for um, how to set the scene on those four corners in bed because I lived down the street when I was 21 on my version of the come up in that startup. And again, I set it in the same building, right? And it's not the same company. There are some similarities and some overlap, I'm not gonna lie, um, but there's also key differences in personnel and, and, and what they're doing. Um, but I pulled from some of my experience in order to do this. And you know, I'm really grateful for you because the number one question that people ask me is how much of this is real? And I used to just make jokes to be completely honest. I'd say 22.5% in one interview, then another I'd say 32.7. And then homie from NPR, when he said, how much of this is real? I was about to give him a uh, proportion. He said, I've heard you do this in other interviews. Yeah, that he told you on it. <laughs> yeah, and I said, well, the honest answer is it's hard to say. Mm-hmm. There are many things I could point out that never happened to me for sure. But even then they feel so real that some people that I worked with, for example, a, a woman <laughs> who read the book texted me and I worked with like 230 people at this time. So you can imagine X amount of opinions for however many people oh, read the yeah. book, right? I mean, and this yeah. woman said, Mateo, did someone pour a bucket of white paint on you before I started working there? And I said, no, that never happened. And, and the point of that particular scene, right? I'm not going to explain scene by scene to every person what everything symbolizes. Sure. I've done enough interviews and also I'm leaving up a lot of it to you yeah. to figure out what feels real and what feels absurd. Um, that scene represents what it can feel like so for so many of us in these instances. When we hear a little thing, whether it's a microaggression or whether it's some like casual racism, you hear this little thing and you're like, wait, what? And it can feel like the world is splitting in front of you. It can feel like you're being doused in a bucket of white paint for everyone to see, even if other people aren't clocking it. But that's how it can feel in these scenarios. Wow. So that's what a scene like that represents. So that woman thought that that could have happened. But then I spoke to someone else, a producer. I'm going to end this, this tangent here, but it's just showing you the juxtaposition of responses to a work like this, where there's a lot going on. 
mm -hmm. where it's easy to misconstrue my own intentions and, and what was I thinking as I wrote it. There was a woman who uh, was a producer and not like Hollywood related type things, but for something that I was going to do. And she said, Mateo, does, does any of this stuff, like what, does any of this stuff actually happen to people of color? Like any of this type of stuff? And I said very calmly, you know, X, Y, Z. Um, I have found that the people have a hard time believing that some of these things do happen or could happen are very divorced from the reality that so many of us in the States and around the world experience. Yeah. So you saying that I'm not exactly surprised because you fill in this criteria. Um, but yes, some of these things do happen and it's not on me to convince you in any way. No, I mean, it, it, it feels very, very alive. And, and it's interesting too, thinking about it, like thinking back on how I felt when I read the book, it was, I also felt like held as I read it. There's <laughs> such confidence in the voice that drives mm. the storytelling. And because of the way that you open the book, you know, with Buck sort of giving yeah. the beginning of this sales pitch, you're sort of reassured as a reader that you're going to be like taken care of as you go through mm -hmm. this story, which is such a generous thing to give your audience because it's a lot, it's a lot to kind of go through with him because I think it is, I think it does just challenge the reader. I, I, I yeah. can only imagine that there's some very polarizing reactions to re reading this because oh, some people that. probably don't want to face what it's asking them to face in themselves as they read this, you know, like even how bold the sort of the sales look like the, at what do you, what would you call that? You know, when you call like the, the direct bold, addresses. Yeah. 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 The, the bold direct addresses of like, here's what you need to learn about sales right now. But really it's kind of like, here's what you need to the learn about yourself or, maxims or, or lessons, the world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and that could go terribly wrong and it goes so right in this book. And, but I also found myself like feeling like I was sort of being held and I was being yeah. like taken on this journey. And then I was waiting for those. Like I was hungry for those. Cause I was like, okay, that's going to help me get, get through this next stretch of like thinking about things and questioning things and doubting corporations and doubting myself and doubting my motives. And, you know, so it was, it was such an interesting thing that came out of it because you know, when you first read it, you're like, wait, am I reading a self-help book or am I reading like a, a how to be a salesperson now? Uh, like, you know, whatever, like a manual or something, you know, and, and, but so quickly you're, you're on this journey where you're like, oh, wow, this really, I found myself wanting to give myself really focused time to read like 20 pages at a time. I didn't want to sit and read long stretches because I felt like it was asking so much of me in each yeah. stretch, you know, like mm -hmm. I didn't want to skim through what was being asked of me. I was like, oh, wait, I, I feel like this is awakening something in me and I want to actually give it space to like yeah. resonate in myself, which is rare. I mean, you could ask my husband, I'm an avid reader and I like to just like get, you know, read 200 pages in a day or whatever. Oh, told you know? me, we sat next to each other at the event. Oh, there you go. Very so, suave man, yeah. yeah. So, um, but yeah, so I, I don't know. I just, I think that- um, This makes just, me think of a lot. Yeah, it's really, it's really unusual, I think for fiction mm -hmm. to have such a hold over an audience member uh, exploring themselves. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it, it's yeah. not just like, oh, I enjoy these characters and I'm going for the ride. It's sort of like, you're kind of pulled into it in a way where you're like, yeah. oh man, I got to deal with everything this guy's dealing with. <laughs> like, that, that, that's exactly true, Jen. Um, there's a lot that's being asked of the reader. And as you, as you articulated in the beginning, you can open the book and say, what is this? And then you can also close it at the end and say, what was that? And it's on you. To be, uh, some readers describe it as whiplash. It's on you to yeah. decide yeah. what yeah. was this? What, what, how do I feel about these themes? Because there, there are some critiques where they say, Mateo, your thoughts on X, Y, Z weren't that clear. Your thoughts on capitalism weren't that clear. Your thoughts on whether we, and this is coming from, let's talk about a black person, we black people should be engaging in these spaces where these types of things could happen to us. And I say, well, that was on purpose because I'm not here to tell you how to think. Right. I'm here to raise the questions and then you have to fill in the blanks. And the reason that that's a risk is because then people could say, 
what was your intention or what were you doing? Or I didn't like this because this wasn't that clear to me or I, want, I wanted you to spoon feed me. No, I want you to do work. But the work that I want you to do is to consume this content and these themes and ask questions of yourself. The work that I don't want you to do, and this is why I wrote it in such a conversational and clear tone, yeah. is I don't want you to ask yourself what's happening in the scene. I want this scene to plunge you into it yes. immediately so that yeah. then you can contend with everything else that's going on. Um, a few other things that came up as you were speaking is the, the direct addresses, right? Breaking the fourth wall in a very bolded manner. I did that because I did want the book to feel like a sales manual. I wanted it to feel like the sales manuals that were handed to me when mm -hmm. I got into the sales game and these co-founders gave me these books that I still have, uh, the sales Bible, the little red book of selling by Jeffrey Gittimer. As I was writing black buck, um, this was like draft 3.5 or draft four before I started querying more agents. And I got, and I queried the agent who would become my agent. Um, I was thinking about Mohsin Hamed's how to get filthy rich in rising Asia, which I had read many years before. And the beginning of every chapter is a maxim of how to get filthy rich in rising Asia. Befriend a corrupt bureaucrat, stash some money, don't be afraid to get your hands dirty, whatever. And then I was also reading a book called The Residue Years by Mitchell S. Jackson. And this book, he would use the direct address to the reader, but wow. it was very like subtle. He would write people, comma, and he knew that he was addressing you, the reader. Huh. So all of those things combined, I had already queried a bunch of agents, but I said, no, 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 no. I've already broken the fourth wall on the author's note. Now I want to, to use a Hollywood term that I've been hearing, punch it up, <laughs> you know, and, and, uh, and, and really let people know what time I'm on. So that's why the direct addresses are in there. Most people that I speak to say that they like them, but mm -hmm. then Jen, I've heard all, I'm sure. I've heard the 360. And then some people say, Mateo, I didn't like them so much because they took me out of the narrative and the narrative flow. And I just wanted to keep going. The reason why I put them in there is aside from the format of it as being a sales manual was because I knew that this story was going to be so intense that I wanted this older version of Darren yeah. Yeah. who survived in some way to say, I know this shit is crazy, but just hold on and I'll explain everything. That's yeah. why he's constantly coming in and being like very self-aware. I know, I know, I know. Yeah, I love it. I, I I love it. But I I can also see that there would be people that feel challenged by it. You know, it's like, but it's um it's almost like you're on a roller coaster and the direct addresses are like the safety thing holding you in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like, all right, here we go. We're going to yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> when it flips you upside down, you know that you're right, not. But I know fall. I'm okay. I'm strapped in. I'm strapped in. I'm strapped. But in. sometimes you do fall. <laughs> 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 uh, well, we're, we're getting close to the end of our time here, but I, I want to ask one last question, which sure. is, um, what is, uh, like, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given or, or whether it was given to you or something you read or, you know, and, and by whom or from where? <sighs> this is, this is a tough one. It's always tough to answer this question. Yeah. Um, but again, trying to, uh, keep it a buck. One of the best pieces of, of advice that I received was also from the same person who years later was one of those people being like, don't be a writer. I don't think that you should do this. Wow. But what they told me was, and I remember the exact moment, but I'm not trying to build the scene. What's most important is what they said to me. They looked me in the eye. I was 22. And they said, Mateo, go as far as you can until someone or someone stops, someone or something stops you. That wow. was it. That's all he told me. And I'll never forget it. I internalized that immediately. That's cool. Yeah. I love that. I'm, I'm taking that from you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, now uh, I can't, I can't, I can't hold myself back. One last piece of advice that helped me a lot. And it was yeah. from that book, Plot and Structure and James Scott Bell, which was, um, don't judge yourself in the act of creation. Mm. One reason why I was able to write two manuscripts write two books and then keep going and write a third, which would be Black Buck that did all these things is because I was able to sit down in front of a blank word document and internalize the concept of not judging myself while writing. Just wow. write, just yeah. write and just finish and then know that you can always revise. 
good advice. It's really yeah. good advice. And it's hard to take. It's, uh, it's Very amazing hard. How, um, how hard we all are on ourselves and our mind. Yeah, our minds are so noisy. <laughs> we got to be kind to ourselves, especially now. Yeah. And it's hard to override that. Well, Mateo, thank you so much for taking the time. I'm obsessed with this book. I love it so much. Um, I cannot wait to share it with everybody across our platform. Um, And if there's ever anything we can do to support you or be there for you, we can't wait for whatever comes next. And um, we just want to keep you in our creative family. Definitely. Thank you for your time and and, and, uh, everything you're doing and talk more soon, hopefully. Okay. Have a great weekend. You too. Bye. Bye.